Oh, oh, girl, it is time for another episode of Girl Talk. And this week is a special episode, and by that I mean it's a girl first. I don't have any co-hosts. They are absolutely busy doing their other projects. So this week I get the pleasure of having our guest all to myself. And I will be talking with the fabulous Groove Juggernaut, or if you would like to know the real name, it is Stephen. But we can do either on this podcast. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. You are more than welcome. It is, like I said, genuinely a pleasure. And I get you all to myself because the other two are too busy. So this is all for me. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so how's sort of life been recently? How have you been getting on? Oh, it's been um, a lot more chill. I just got back from a, a, a tour with Loveless and uh, I've been sleeping in my own bed. So, you know, it's nice. But, um, you know, trying to get, get into a new flow and still lots of things to do so it's it's just weird to transition from kind of doing the same thing every single day and knowing exactly what's needed of you to waking up every morning and having all of the pressures of you know making your own schedule if that makes sense yeah you, you've got to read that back into sort of a different kind of reality don't you after you've had that set sort of thing in motion for a long time it's complex isn't it but it can be fun i mean it looks like it looks like it was a good time um obviously briefly mentioned that you are uh you are a drummer you've been on tour with a band for those of you know our listeners who might not be aware of who you are at the moment how would you in one sentence describe yourself i'm a musician i'm the drummer for cartographer and i also am a hired gun drummer for several bands uh the most recent and one that i tour with most often is called loveless uh mostly in the rock world um yeah, that was that was a sentence, probably. It works. I mean, there, there were words in an order. I think that's yeah. the English language. <laughs> as a sentence. It's better than I probably would have done if someone asked uh, to describe myself. I would have just been like, uh... <laughs> so on this, uh, so me? this this recent tour you've had, what was that sort of like? How's it been the last couple of months? Because it's been a fairly long tour, hasn't it? Yeah, it was the longest I've ever done. Prior to that, I think I had done a five week run. Uh, most of the tours I've been on have been about around a month. This one was six weeks, which doesn't seem like that much longer, but it really, I don't know, toward the end of it, I was it was getting real difficult to uh, muster the energy, you know. And we were on a, what's called a bandwagon, which is not really a tour bus. It's like basically a modded out box truck. So trying to sleep while you're bumping through the night and that thing and then you know, everything just compounding. You don't really have your own space. Uh, it was a direct support tour. So we didn't even really have control of the venues when we got there. It just it, You always feel like you're in the way and it, it, it's stressful to be in that place for so long. Yeah, the extra week would definitely make a difference in that situation though, because if you're not getting the chance to sleep like you normally would, like you said, one of the things that you've got home to is your own bed. But even just that yeah. change makes all the difference, doesn't it? Yeah. So obviously these are sort of the struggles I've been on tour, but do you have any sort of particular fond memories, any favorite things that have happened in the last sort of six weeks while you've been out on the, on the tour? Yeah. I mean, as, as far as the tour, it's, I mean, I, the the classic answer I give people whenever it was like, oh, how was tour? It's like the shows were great. And that's like the most succinct way I can sum it up. Like every single show was was fantastic. You know, once we actually started making the music on the stage and you know that at the end of the day makes it all worth it so definitely the shows themselves okay that that's a good standard answer but we don't really tend to accept those on this podcast so i need something behind yeah, that's the fine give me something juicy go on like a, i don't know something daft would have happened on tour it always does surely yeah this one was less crazy i mean like the the run we did right before this one was the run of a thousand things going wrong and somehow we we just got that all out of the way in the in, in the previous tour. It was like you know, the bus would break down one day, and then somebody would break their ankle the next day, and then I don't know, the venue would be super mean to us for no reason, and like cut the AC in the middle of the set. And it was just like one thing after another. Um, so this one, it feels like we start. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was brutal. That was uh, Mahal's. I'm gonna cut call them out by name. <laughs> Do it. Uh, that was the venue that cut the AC. It was just uh, kind of a nightmare place to play. Um, but yeah, not a lot of drama. Um, fortunately, you know, working with, with professionals here, um, and all of us have kind of done this before, but 
maybe I'm just getting used to it. Maybe you just need to prod me for like a specific thing. Is there's pro- as soon as I think of something, I'll probably start ranting. You know what was kind of uh, probably the most difficult on this run was dealing with local stage hands. Mm. Uh, you know, like the people who uh, will sometimes help load in our gear and stuff like that. It was just like a level of incompetence I hadn't seen before. And it, I don't know if we just kept getting unlucky or whatever, but like, it it was just like, somebody hired you? Like you went through an interview process and somebody was like, yeah, this this is our guy. Like, cause it's just basic common sense stuff getting, it's not, it's not a very difficult job. You're really just, you know, moving gear and staying out of the way. But the, the way, the creative ways in which they would manage to fuck it up was, uh, just comical at times. Yeah, give me give me a favorite comical fuck up then. I'll take that one. I mean, it's like people would just. Uh, the most common one is is people just not understanding that drums are round, and so they'll like set them down. Uh, you know, not in a position to to be stable, and so they'll just roll away and and uh, you know get kicked off the stage. Somebody will knock over a cymbal or whatever, and. I just have to start making like hard rules to that I'm the only one who touches stuff, but then I look like an asshole, you know. And and, and, and anyway, I I, I didn't. Uh, what's that? You say you do, the last thing you want is to be chasing your drums like they're like a wheel of cheese or something going down a hill. You know that's not what you need. Yeah. to about to go on stage, is it? So that's, you know, <laughs> there's w- there's one guy, uh, just like a big security guy, who decided he wanted to help out at one point and. I guess he was just trying to prove how many drums he could carry down the stairs at once. And of course he dropped one and it was just like, I just, I know the sound of drums falling down the stairs now. And I never wanted to know what that sounded like. <laughs> That's not a sound that you want, like ingrained in the back of your mind, is it? It sounded like he was trying to go for no. like uh, me, big macho, strong man. I carry all drums and now I drop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're real strong, buddy. Like you're real. You're real strong. Just, could you could you stand at the door and guard? That's that's the job that you <laughs> you get at. Yeah. Oh dear. I mean, yeah, not not ideal, um, certainly. But it sounds like other than that, it was you know at least from you guys' side, the more sort of professional. You know, you've done this a few times now. It's not your first rodeo situation, so that's always good. And then yeah, the, the... the weirdest part is like the, like the direct support thing, like I mentioned, um, just like trying to stay out of the way, you know. Because yeah. Water Parks was the band we were on the on the road with, um, if you know them, yeah. and their uh, their their production was really big for this run. So I mean, just finding the space physically to set up a drum set before the show, or even during the show, to like have a place that's you know reasonable for us to perform was a yeah. challenge. I can imagine. I, I saw them when they were um, they were in the UK supporting, I believe it was Uni at 6 at the time, and they were just a support act. So I saw the show that they put on then, so getting that sort of, you know, full stage of themselves, I can only imagine what it was like. So yeah, I, w- I wouldn't like to be trying to sort of set up behind them by that way. Um, I can I can see the struggle there. So well done. I mean, it still looks successful from everything that we've seen on, you know, social media and stuff. Obviously, that'll be the highlights of the tour that you want everyone to see, but you're not really going to film yeah. the guy dropping the drums in the background, are you? That's no fun. Yeah, or, or I don't know. Like, I, I called, uh, <laughs> I was mentioning to somebody, somebody hit me up while I was standing in like a Loves parking lot. You know what a Loves is? It's like a travel gas station. It's just super common uh, yeah. stop for buses and truckers and stuff like that. But I don't know, we were in the middle of Texas somewhere. We were almost home. It was like It was like five or six days until we were getting back. So, I was pretty ready to to be done with it. And uh, somebody was just, you know, saying how amazing the shows looked and like asking me what I was doing. And I just looked around me at the most like depressing town. I I don't even remember where we were, but like, you know, an in-between town in Texas, like not even one of the major stops. And it was like smoky, dusty in the air. And all there is is the two gas stations and like, I'm trying to find Wi-Fi so I can try and get anything done on my off day or whatever. I just you know, remember trying to find some kind of like positivity in that moment to express to my friend who is, you know, very rightfully so like trying to gas me up a little bit and tell me how, how much I, I've made it and stuff. And then I'm looking around like, I don't really want to be here right now. <laughs> That's the stuff you don't film. You kind of like, it sounds like you were stuck in some horror movie setting, really. Like, between. It really did look like it. Like, when, 
I stepped off the the, the bus, quote unquote, the, the bandwagon thing, and uh, you know, I, I literally just couldn't process. I mean, it's always weird to process where you are the first time you step off. Like to, you show up in a different climate, or um, you know, obviously a different city or something like that, and you're trying to get your bearings. But this one was like. It was like I was in a nightmare or something like that. I'm like, what possible reason could we have to be here right now? Yeah, it doesn't sound like it was worth stopping for gas at that particular place, to be fair. But uh, maybe that's the next sort of set of TikToks when you're on tour again. Like, just like the most literally horrifying, like, possible death sets that you get to experience <laughs> on the tour. Someone's got to be. Yeah, there. maybe. I mean, I'd, I'd watch a series about that. Put a nice I did start. Uh, I jokingly actually started an Instagram page. Um, I was laughing with our merch manager, Eamon, because we were both just like sitting there at a laundromat, like waiting for our stuff. Just, you know, the most boring scene you can possibly imagine. Um, and I was like, you know, this is the shit I should be posting to my stories. Because every time I look back, it, it looks like I'm just on the road having a blast the whole time, you know. And so I started an account that was uh, supposed to be just like all of the, the stupid stuff that I would never, oh, my not cool guy shit, you know. And I think I made one post sitting at a laundromat with Eamon, and now the account sits there looking like a fake. <laughs> oh, dear. I mean, yeah, maybe maybe something for next time. You kind of get distracted, though. I mean, if you're on, on tour for six weeks and, you know, you've got the sort of roadies to deal with, you've got the lack of sleep, you know, trying to fight for the stage sort of space, you're probably not going to think that much about the account that you started as a joke, really, are you? But... It, you know, it's something you yeah. for next time, maybe a daft little TikTok series or something, just to, I don't know, behind the, people like behind the scenes stuff, especially if it's done in a silly way. So Yeah, I needed to be better about that, I think. I, I, I didn't have a ton of energy to do that sort of stuff on this run. I usually try and be a little bit better about showing some perspective that's not just, you know, oh, look at this amazing room and here's a clip of people screaming at us, you know, because it's mostly not that. <laughs> No, it's def- I think we've all been to a gig or two, and it's definitely not that. Even from like the crowd perspective, you know, it's not that. But hey, it's it. It's yeah, something to look forward to you next time, isn't it? But uh, yeah, off the back of that tour, um, obviously there's recently been the video release uh, with Loveless for I Love It When It Rains. That involves mm-hmm. an absolute shit ton of water coming down on everyone. What was that like to film yeah. under those kind of conditions? Like, is it something you've done before? Absolutely not. Uh, and it, I don't think it's anything most of the people involved in it had done before if anybody um because from the very beginning of planning it it seemed like nobody was accounting for the fact that we can't we can't just put our gear in water <laughs> like mm-hmm. so last minute we everybody was scrambling because like the you know the production team and management and everybody like nobody had accounted for the fact that we were going to say no when they asked us to like submerge our our gear in water I ended up finding uh, or thinking of a drum set that I have, uh, which is the one in the video that already had a little bit of water damage to it. And it had been sitting on a shelf for years. I was like, you know, this thing, maybe I'll refurbish it one day, but it's kind of a cheap kit as much as I liked it and got some use out of it. Like might as well go out with a bang. So I decided to ruin the drum set for that video shoot because it was submerged in water for hours. It definitely got warped. I mean, it's it's made for a pretty cool video, but you're right. You know, you people when they're watching it don't really think, "Oh yeah, crap, that's actual like stuff that shouldn't be underwater in a general day." But it 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 was good. I mean, R.I.P. Drum Kit. It did go out with a bang. So you know, it's it could have had. To, it may could have still been on a shelf. Let's be honest. It's one of those. It sounds like one of those things where you know you keep telling yourself for another year that it'll be off the shelf and then a year later you say maybe next year so hey you know go out in a not even a blaze of glory more like a soggy glory i guess but, <laughs> yeah exactly glory nonetheless how is it for you though because obviously you also got absolutely drenched in the video yeah i mean music videos are really hard that's those are the i mean even without the water uh for drummers specifically it's a really hard gig because you are in every single shot usually uh, mm-hmm. for a performance video like that. Like even when they're doing close-ups on guitar or on on Julian. Um, I don't know why I called Dylan guitar and I said Julian's actual name. Um, but, you know, even when they're doing even when they're doing the close-up shots, like I got to be in the background, like still giving it a hundred percent in case I get picked up in a you know a random cut. 
and then you are generally in like a big echoey warehouse or something like that that the drums sound so loud and out of control and i'm just trying to listen to the speaker that's playing off um off camera obviously so it's not very close to me and i'm trying to like stay on beat so i can't hit very loud i have to fake hit the drums uh like when i when i go to hit the snare drum in the middle i i intentionally hit the rim uh and yeah it's it, it takes more energy to play like that like to to make it look like you're playing all big and heavy but you're actually not <laughs> it takes a lot of control as well because you've got to know like, like the exact moment to stop you know before yeah. you just turn it into a proper big whack instead it's impressive though because obviously you know the way that it looks when it's edited when it's came out you, you can't tell for a second that you are faking it so you know kudos right <laughs> it's a good well role. thanks uh, but yeah, I, it's so... definitely taken a few videos of me like for, i've definitely gone over the top like i i think i need to m move more than i do and i've looked back at some early music videos i've done and just cringe at like how much it does not look like i'm playing the drums <laughs> it just looks like i'm like I, i'm an actor who's faking it i mean to and overacting that's, that's just most music videos at the end of the day isn't it but you know you can, you can always try and bring the energy level down it's harder to try and bring the energy level up you know, and yeah, that's true. That's true. Bit, so, but uh, I'd rather give them more than they need for sure. Exactly, it shows enthusiasm, and it, it and it's kind of funny to watch as well. Like if you think, if you look at the background, you can tell someone's offbeat, for example, <laughs> but they're offbeat in a slow way. It makes them look less enthusiastic. You just look like you've had a few mm. Red Bulls and you've got excited. So, you know, <laughs> not the worst thing you could do. Uh, so obviously, you know, you, you do the drums for Loveless, and you've mentioned also a photographer. How did you sort of get started with that? You know, where where did these things come from? Um, with playing with those bands, or like playing with bands in general? Playing with those bands specifically to start with. We'll, we'll go into more of the history of yourself later. Don't worry. Well, they, they both kind of came from the same camp, um, and I, what I mean is like uh, there's like an unofficial collective of musicians um, that at some point we all just kind of started playing on each other's projects and we give each other work whenever we can um, again it's super unofficial it's, it's like a lot of people that hang out around um the the studio that i'm a part of and just like friends of ours and um anyway for whatever reason we, we've just kind of built this really supportive collective of people and there are several bands within that it you know like when loveless started uh i was already there you know like when it was just dylan and julian i've been best friends and roommates with dylan for a long time and so he was showing me all the early demos and um once they started to take it really seriously and knew that it was going to go somewhere uh it was an obvious choice that i would come in and play live so um yeah, and that's how that one happened. Good. So it sounds like there's like a nice little sort of family, basically. You know, you've got obviously, you know, you and Dylan have been friends for that time. So it was natural born into that one. But then, like you said, you've got this studio space where you've got all the different artists that can collaborate. We need more of that, realistically. You know, a lot of bands get sort of stuck yeah. in of like, no, this is us. This is our four or five members. That's it. You know, if we need one extra person for tour, probably not going to be the same person each time. I, I like that you've built that up, you know, and I, th I think if more bands sort of had that uh, as like sort of a second family effectively, we get a lot more cool crossovers realistically because, you know, it's, uh, it's a good little sort of setup you've got there. I enjoy it. Yeah, it's it's not only the, the crossover, which is artistically really helpful, obviously, but um, I mean, it's just it's really hard to, to be a musician uh, in a day when it, I mean, not, it's really just a money thing, honestly. Like, there are a lot of things that uh, I can do because we pooled our resources that I would otherwise not be able to do. I mean, recording drums, for instance, is, is a huge undertaking. Uh, for me to have all of the necessary equipment and space to do that myself, uh, I mean, it's a dream, but it's also, you know, unrealistic for as much as I work and where i live and the cost of living here and stuff so the fact that we're able to to pool our resources and accomplish anything that we need outside of a, a label uh you know throwing us money and being indebted to them it's it's invaluable really 
It's, it's impressive too because you know you you've got that sort of sense of hard work and family combining with artists who are just passionate and then you're creating the things that like you said a lot of people do have to have a lot more money thrown at them for so you know it works and it works really well so it's it's nice to see i mean i hope more people will sort of you know take that perspective moving forward sort of learn from things that you guys are doing basically so you know well done well thank you i mean it's it's uh, definitely not a new concept i and I don't even know if anybody who I don't even know if anybody else who's in our camp would necessarily think of our camp the same way I do. But uh, I've wanted this for a long time. Uh, when I first showed up to L.A., I was doing this residency at a place called Piano Bar. And there was this band, the West Coast Get Down, uh, who started popping off uh, right when I got there. And they, for me, really set that example. Um, they if you know Kamasi Washington, he's become like a really famous uh, jazz musician now. And uh, he, his record popped off and they had their whole camp, their little collective of jazz musicians had everything in place so that they were ready whenever the first one of them got any attention. You know, they all went out on the road together. All of them recorded their own projects. Like I got to see right off the bat, like the, uh, kind of the moments I'm experiencing right now, um, and it felt it felt right. I don't know. It's it's like they made that happen themselves. Um, they got to keep their independence once things popped off, and they still maintained leverage. And they get the you know the feeling of doing it as a family and a community, and really like creating a culture, uh, and not just like I don't know the capitalistic version of creating music i guess it's kind of it's it's the antithesis to that to me oh absolutely and it's it's empowering as well you know that's that's kind of one of the main parts of it is that by doing it in this sort of way you get to stick to your own guns you get to do it the way that you want to together so you know it, it's really nice and hopefully we can sort of see more of that you know seeing how it's working if you've got that sort of formula other people can adapt to that formula you know it's just about how it works for your particular sort of family your sort of troop and getting it right but yeah keep keep up the good work yeah realistically uh, from the sort of cartographer side then obviously you've just got back with the loveless side are we going to get more music from cartographer are we going to see a little tour anytime soon perhaps yeah, definitely. Um, it's been really hard to to balance the two bands over the last uh, year and a half, as as Loveless like started to get a lot more work and um, requiring more attention, and then eventually requiring Dylan and myself to physically not be here. Uh, it it kind of started putting us on these real short timelines uh, where it's like when we're not touring with Loveless, we are full steam ahead with cartographer whether it was we needed to develop a catalog in the beginning so we put ourselves on like okay we're going to release a song every six weeks um and it was uh, really stressful and difficult to keep up with that timeline we set for ourselves but i'm super thankful that we did it now because now there's this summer uh where there's not a lot happening with loveless and we have enough music out and enough of a buzz going that the live shows are starting to roll in now so uh yeah we're doing live shows this summer and the first one which is on may 1st is a showcase for a booking agency that books for uh a bunch of our friends bands like going back to the you know the the whole community and and collective that we got going like part of that is that you know when we start getting interest from people like that, like a booking agency, which is the next thing we're looking for. Um, it's like, it's obvious for them. It's, you know, they're, they have a bunch of references, a bunch of people that they know and work with vouch for us. And we already have bands lined up that it's like uh, a no brainer to bill us with and package us with to go do tours, you know? So whether or not we were thinking about it when we were, you know, building all these relationships and making connections with people we were genuinely inspired by. Um, it's becoming really helpful right now in this moment. Sounds ideal. It sounds like you've, you know, you've built up the foundations to set up for an ideal future, really. And that's kind of where you've got to start is, you know, 
build these friendships, build this background of sort of experience. You've got your examples of your projects. You've worked with all these different artists, and now it's sort of the time to push that forward. I don't think you're going to have any trouble, realistically. <laughs> I mean, the success of you know recent tours and the way that the traction's building online, from what I've just seen myself, to me says that it's going to keep going in the right direction. So. Well, thank you to, to seeing it. It'll be quite fun. Now, obviously, you've had a lot of crossover with the two bands. What would you say is your favorite song from each of them to play live? Uh, th- I'm not even just saying it because it's the new single or whatever. The the rains has has always been a, a favorite of ours to to play um, from from the first time we just messed around with it during a tech rehearsal before the last tour. We got done playing it and we we're like, oh, this one's gonna go hard live. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, so it, and it yeah it's just become more and more fun as i get more comfortable with it um i also really love playing voodoo uh, if you have my voodoo doll please give it a hug that's uh, another loveless song I, it, it generally is stuff that's really that didn't come naturally to me at first that uh then becomes the most fun to play you know something i had to work for a little bit yeah, like an like an achievement that you've taught yourself to like nail basically yeah and then it's i don't know Maybe it, maybe it's like when you learn a, a new word or an idea or something like that, and then you it, you get enjoyment out of like showing people. I don't know. That's maybe not the greatest metaphor, but like it's it's a new thing that I didn't have in my arsenal before, and it, it's a an enjoyable feeling to showcase it. You know, That's, I mean, it's a good reason to enjoy playing a song live. Is you know a skill that you've adapted to. So, what about cartographer then? What's uh, what would be your favorite at the moment for that one? Yeah, it's tough. I've been diving deep into the songs uh, every single day since we got back from the tour. And it kind of shifts around, you know, like, because I'm in the process right now of uh, cartographer songs are a little bit more technical. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's There's a lot more just time that I need to put into these before they get anywhere close to the level of comfortability I have with the Loveless catalog. So in that sense, you know, I really enjoy playing the ones that I have under my fingers right now. <laughs> and uh, I'm, it's probably going to change as, as the more complicated ones become more comfortable. Um, I love Sanctuary. Uh, it's just got a really fun uh, groove in that happens several times throughout this kind of like digga 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 boom boom digga digga. It's just a fun double bass thing to play. It's not super complicated, but uh, I've really been I've been trying to nail it and get it feeling very groovy you know to go with the branding obviously oh yes <laughs> well, i mean that's uh, i'm sorry i'm sorry i was just, I was just gonna say it like uh, uh, the the name uh the name was initially thought of because of how many different styles i was playing and you know i started out doing the metal thing and stuff but i dove way into the jazz world for a little while and um, was doing a lot of local like neo soul R and B type grooves, super low volume things. I've always, no matter the genre, I've always connected most with things that that grooved that that felt really good. And I I thought for, I think for some reason a lot of metal bands decided at one point that they didn't need to have that, like they were exempt from groove. <laughs> and and a, you know, there's a time and place for it. I, I appreciate that kind of music from time to time, but like. I want to hear some humanity and uh, connect, even if you're playing something really technical or really fast, you know? Yeah, I think everything can be with a little bit of groove every now and again. You know, you've got to, you've got to put it in there because you've got to enjoy it, you know? it's It's got to be fun for the musicians to play as well as, you know, maybe being technical or a bit louder for the heavy metal fans. When did you pick up sort of drumming, you know, as a starting thing like when was your first pair of sticks that you just sort of fell into i got a pair of sticks from the vh why am i calling it the vhs store the video store uh like the local video store in paradise california i don't know i think i was like six or something um before that it was pots and pans so you've always <laughs> been sort of grooving away yeah it, it was it was just in me i don't, I don't know the exact timeline but uh, at an early age, I was pulling out pots and pans enough times that uh, my parents bought me the sticks at the video store, and then the couches got beat up enough that I 
I, I, I say I bought my first drum set because my, my parents ended up getting me a hookup with a drum set, quote unquote, uh, that I tore through in, in like a matter of months. I mean, it was like some old garage sale thing that just, uh, was not it. So <laughs> that, you know, that just became trash after a few months and I saved up a bunch of allowance to buy myself a drum set for $326 at my local drum shop. And I kept that until I was 19. That was the only drum set I had. So it does sound like you were basically born to drum effectively then. I mean, some people just have something inside of them that navigates that direction that they want to go in really. Like, did you find that you had any sort of like early musical influences that sort of pushed you in that direction? Yeah, it was John Bonham. I used to watch the, I don't even remember which DVD it was or VHS or whatever. Uh, it was just like a Led Zeppelin live thing that had a bunch of documentary footage cut in between it. And I just thought that looked really fun. I liked his big drum set. Uh, I had been listening to Zeppelin because of my parents and stuff. So yeah, it, it was definitely Bonzo that got me interested in it. But I have to clarify, like the as much as I like knew I loved playing drums, it was not a career trajectory for me at all until I was like 17, 18, you know? It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be a rock star when I grow up. Like I never had that. It was always just like, yeah, drums are fun and I'm going to keep doing it, you know? It's nice that I can turn from sort of a fun sort of hobby that you enjoy into a career, though, you know, even if it is unexpected. I think that's the way that a lot of people wish they could approach things. But sometimes if you have it in mind that you're going to go into that sort of world, it's not necessarily the world that you get into. So this more natural yeah. sort of curve is it's pretty cool, really. I mean, if you at the minute could choose preferably someone that's alive, um, to work with and collaborate with, who straight off, no delays, would be the first pick. Claudio Sanchez from Coheed and Cambria. Nice. Not expected, but nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, Coheed's my favorite band. I have a tattoo of them. Um, it was just one of those that I loved in high school, but for whatever reason, uh, didn't have the self-esteem to like own it. And I kind of pretended I didn't like it and in inevitably came back to it and realized I was being dumb. And that was why I got the tattoo. Just like, you know, just like what you like, own it, be proud of it. And uh, yeah, Claudio is just an incredible, incredible musician who is an incredible person who has just led a life that is exemplary to me as far as, you know, hitting all of the points creatively and, uh, everything that i would want to do you know and uh any excuse to to be around him in general but i mean to make music would be out of this world and i hope we get to do it it's something that we can hopefully manifest for the future i mean it'll be it's nice to see someone achieve that kind of dream you know and it's not it doesn't feel to me like it's too unrealistic you know there's a lot of collaborations that go on in the sort of music world and i think there's that sort of respect for each other as artists where you know, if you find out that someone does want to work with you, there's no reason why it can't happen. So uh, let's, you know, get the prayer beads out, do a little bit of voodoo. Um, <laughs> you know, yes, please. <laughs> if someone needs to put out a petition, you know, hell, I'll sign it. Why not? See how it goes. I did. Uh, I did get to meet him. Uh, we we played a Jason festival with Loveless, um, and they were also on the same stage. So I got to see him play side stage, and then. I uh, I saw after they got done with their set, the whole band was just hanging out, like talking by the uh, by the truck, like with all the gear. And the rest of us that had played that stage have access to like the backstage area still. Uh, and I had to like my friend had to basically push me over there to go say hi to him because I was so nervous. But uh we had a really cool conversation and he ended up remembering my name. He, he met, uh, he met Dylan uh, from Loveless later that day. And, uh, and he was like, Oh yeah, I, I met your drummer earlier, Steven. And when I heard that he like actually was listening to the conversation, I don't know. <laughs> it, it was kind of a moment. fever dream when I was talking to him. 
that sounds amazing that's that's the kind of things in life that you need though like those little experiences that can potentially to bigger ones in the future but hopefully you know remember your name for a longer time and you can create something out of that so keep the thing yeah, he just seems like he's got that he's he's one of those guys that's just got that kind of brain and i don't have that kind of brain where i can i just remember those details about people but um i don't know i have a feeling we'll if we run into each other again he would likely remember the remember that you know or not i don't know <laughs> there's only one way to find out make it happen yeah let's do so it you, you mentioned obviously um sort of a sense of pride in there and obviously when you're you're drawing into your you've got all your videos and stuff you have a pride flag in display um, yeah you have a, sort of a, a set community uh, which we happen to be part of could you give us and our sort of listeners just a bit of an idea of your own experiences with that sort of community? Sure. Uh, it, for me as a person, it's a relatively new experience being actually part of the queer community. It was something that I was just, as with most people, I'm sure, just a, a long process leading up to a realization Um a couple of years back that I was like, well, I don't really know what I am, but I'm not hetero and I'm going to figure out what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it coincides with, with having been part of the community uh, as an ally and just having friends and uh, that have been queer their whole lives uh, that are very close to me. Um, the band cartographer now is three-fourths gay. <laughs> so we, we've kind of leaned into that lately, uh, trying to make that a little bit more part of our brand and make sure that we are a welcome environment for that community. It's good, it's good that you, you know, once you realize it about yourself, it's a lot easier to embrace, isn't it? Because if you sort of have that questioning of, you know, well, what am I myself? You know, you kind of have to sort of explore, don't you really, and find out what is, you know, your tribe as an individual, and then how does that expand into the further community? I did notice what, one of my favorite videos from Cartographer was, it was just guys with the with the flag running around and being like, you know, <laughs> hey, bye, straight, whatever, listen to us. Yeah. Like, that's it's just a great attitude to have, really, isn't it? Like, it doesn't matter who you are, let's just enjoy music together, really. So it's, it's yeah. really fun, you know? Do you feel like you're getting there on your journey yourself, or do you think there's still, like, a way to go? Well, I would say there's a way to go in the sense that, like, um, I, I'm just still kind of exploring where. So I'm I'm queer on the sexual side. I I just uh, have not really been able to identify what to call myself, you know. Uh, and since I'm still exploring, I decided not to box myself in and just say I'm queer. And um, uh, basically, I'm. I'm just not attracted to men <laughs> specifically. Uh, and that was my uh, aversion to including myself in the community for the longest time. Um, but after a few experiences, I had to kind of take a hard look and be like, okay, well, you know, like I was with somebody who was non-binary, for instance. Um, yeah. Like I, I had to, you know, after after a few experiences like that, I had to start, asking myself um i didn't even start asking myself actually somebody uh, had mentioned that i was hetero and i just kind of instinctively was like what no i'm not you know but then i realized i haven't really told anybody about like what's been going through my head the last couple of years so uh, i had to like weirdly come out to dylan and 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 matt my my roommates which was like more thought it was going to be you know because to me it was like this, this is something i've known for a while but like to vocalize it to your friends you know sometimes that's the hardest part isn't it because you kind of you can think a lot about what you think about yourself but then you know you, you sort of even though you've known your friends for years you, you've probably witnessed them being accepting you know in general to the community right. to, to other people it's always a bit different when it's yourself having that conversation and you know, I, I think you've done done right there. Like, don't don't box yourself in. You know, even if you are, you know, a fully, you know, fully gay man, for example, that doesn't mean you still have to have a box around it. You could, for example, sure, yeah. like you said someone non-binary might come up and you might fall in love with them as a person, or just be attracted mm -hmm. to them as a person. It doesn't even have to be love. It can just be anything. And then that yeah. sort of goes, oh, actually, maybe I'm not 
exactly what I thought I am, or maybe I still class myself as that, but this is the exception. You know, it's all a journey of discovery. You know, it's just one sort of aspect of life, really, isn't it? But I'm assuming that the reaction um, was absolutely fine, <laughs> considering everything seems to be still. Oh, yeah, well. of course. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't expect. I mean, my, it was obviously a good conversation, and I haven't had any. Uh, I haven't had any kind of like awkwardness or pushback um, since I've been more open about this kind of thing. But I also uh, haven't had direct conversations with a lot of people about it. So you know, maybe there's some people who uh, would have an issue with it. But you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. I guess. Yeah, if they aren't paying your bills, that might as much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess I'm thinking of like family and shit. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, fair enough. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a different kind of conversation. But they should realistically have love for you unconditionally, even if they're not necessarily fully in understanding or approval of you know the direction your life's taken. They're still gonna love. Yeah, you would think so. Yeah, you would think well, that. You would. Uh, but that's, I mean... that's the most positive spin we can try and uh, put on that. I think, even though it may not necessarily <laughs> be true. <laughs> But uh, that that would be a whole another conversation. I think that would be a full length podcast episode if we talk about being yeah, accepted. We'll go into dads next time. <laughs> I know that's a totally different podcast too. Um, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so yeah, do, do you think like obviously you're part of the music industry as a queer person? Do you find it's generally accepting sort of behind the scenes when you you know hanging out with other bands and things? Yeah, but I mean, I'm I'm fortunate to work with a lot of my friends and um the type of people i work with are not tolerant of the of intolerance <laughs> so i mean if there's any kind of whiff of that going on like you're not going to find yourself working with our camp uh, yeah. so i'm I, I feel very safe and supported um when i'm working specifically with uh, I mean, definitely with cartographer, and and that's one of our main goals. Uh, aside from obviously making it comfortable and safe for ourselves, like we ultimately want that for everybody who's working with us and every single person in the crowd or part of the community. But in general, I, I, I've I've not really had much of an issue with it because I'm fortunate to work with good people. It it's not like it doesn't come up, especially when you're uh, traveling through some places that might be a little less uh, informed or experienced with certain concepts. And, you know, then there's Florida. <laughs> there are some, some troubling ones, isn't there? I think, I think what yeah. you said, though, about sort of, you know, being intolerant of intolerance, that is the time when it should be acceptable to be intolerant, you know? it's There's no reason for it otherwise. The only reason you shouldn't tolerate someone's behavior is if they are being intolerant themselves you know it, it yeah it's a it's a struggle it's a bit of an uphill battle but it's getting better and you know having the people surround you that are supportive of it is a good step you know the more you build a family that will protect you the more protected you're going to be really and then we can just find mm -hmm. each other so if anyone's intolerant yeah you know three people lifting them and putting them in a bit is much easier than one person doing it so yeah. mm. <laughs> Would you sort of have any advice for younger queer people, for example, sort of looking to survive life effectively as a queer person? I've never been asked that before. Uh, I mean, not off the top of my head, but speaking on what we were just saying, I, I would say just find your community, you know, and really lean on them. Uh, find people you can truly be yourself around, um, even if it's even if it's just one person, you know. <laughs> Um, and I know it can be harder in some areas than others. Oh, definitely. But this, you know, maybe avoid going out on your own in certain areas for sure. But yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's it. It's a good message to give, you know, find at least one person and then you can work your way up from that realistically. I think it's good. That's, that's yeah. how I started, you know, you have that one person you can find in and then from there, they're like, oh, well, you know, I've got friends who are mm -hmm. of that or part of that community and you just build it. Excellent. So that's sort of a nice, serious thing. And now we're going to do something absolutely stupid. Um, mm. So I asked you to pre-prepare a dad joke um, for a really ridiculous, pointless segment that I call One for the Dads. Um, there's no prize for it. It's just I get everyone to bring a dad joke and see if anyone laughs at it. So did you bring a dad joke with you? 
I did. I think it's funny, though, that we were talking about doing a separate podcast about dads, and you've got a segment called One for the Dads. <laughs> I think if I did a separate dad theme podcast, the segment about dads would be a bit different uh, than this one, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. A few directions we could take for that one. <laughs> so go on, then hit me with it. What's, uh, your, what's your dad joke? Uh, and I, uh, this is an original. Uh, I came up with this in, in my slumber and refined it when I woke up. It is. Uh, at the cross section between music culture and bar culture. So if you're on the younger side, I apologize if you don't get this on every level. Four quarter notes walk into a bar. And one of them goes, oh man, let's get out of here. This place measures. And that was the refined version. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's... You know, like they measure their drinks and it's also like a bar is a measure and you know what? It's it just because this joke is a little bit more sophisticated. It's I shouldn't logical. immediately go into an explanation. Uh, yeah, I like but it. yeah, I like, I like that. It's like a, a logical dad joke. I think that'll be it'll be appreciated by a very specific set of dad. Somebody's jokes. gonna love it. Somebody really is. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think mine's quite as logical. I've got so I've got two. I'll, I'll give you a, a clean one, and then I'll give you a more okay. themed one. Um, so I uh, I asked my new date to meet up at the gym. But he never showed up. I guess we're not going to work out. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty pretty terrible, if I'm honest. But that's the point in the dad joke. Uh, and then the other one is: uh, I recently came into a bunch of money, which is strange for me because I usually use a paper towel. <laughs> I, I saw that one coming <laughs> for sure. <laughs> hey, <laughs> do you just add an extra layer on top of that? Oh, I didn't even mean to. We'll pretend like this, <laughs> like I was just piggybacking. Yeah, that works. I think uh, I think we'll take that. That one, I think that one wins <laughs> because we, we managed to combine it together. That's good. That's right. Excellent. And thus ends the uh, the terrible dad joke section. Cool. So <laughs> back on track. Um, so rest rest of the year then. What what's the sort of goals? What you want to be getting up to? I'm doing the debut live show with Cartographer on May first, and then we have another one at Chain Reaction June third. I'm hoping there's other shows that trickle in uh, local regional things and that we land some kind of a booking deal so that cartographer can tour either this winter or definitely next summer. But it's the summer of cartographer for sure. Uh, we're doing an album as well. going to be writing it and recording it. And uh, it was just announced that Loveless is doing another tour. So we kind of have, a work cut out for us and then uh i head back out on the road with dylan and everybody in september and then we'll close the year out maybe with a cartographer tour nice so just basically flipping between the two tours then yeah i mean trying to capitalize on the momentum and um i mean to, to clarify which i don't think i ever did in the beginning um cartographer is is my band like i'm a member of that band and a writer and have been part of it since the beginning. Uh, well, not since the beginning, but you know, it's my band. Uh, Loveless, I'm a hired gun. And as much as they're the homies and they're, they're part of the camp, like I described and everything, you know, that's going to go where it's going to go. So I'm playing drums and doing everything I can for them uh, as long as it makes sense. Um, but ultimately my, my real, my baby is cartographer. That's the precious one. The one that gets held a little bit more tightly. Yeah, I mean, I work on that one every single day. That's 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 my thing, you know. That's the one I've invested in, and uh, it's definitely, like I said, it's a baby band. We we have a long way to go, but trying to enjoy every every step of it, you know. I can see it going far. You just got to keep mothering it, basically. You know, it's doing well as it is. Momentum starting to build. Keep it going. You know, and you know, if you happen to get that little uh, Coheed crossover, you know, a little bit of a writing session together with a certain artist of a certain mm -hmm. band, you know, that might be a little way to push the band a bit further. But uh, yeah, well, fingers crossed. I hope it. I hope it keeps going well for you. Um, is there anything before we sign off that you directly want to promote more than you've already done? I am Groove Juggernaut. I play for Cartographer, and if you would like to see our first live show come out to bourbon room in hollywood may 1st i think it's like 15 bucks and all the bands are amazing it's a showcase and it's going to be really really cool 
And when's the uh, second gig, just in case people can't make that one? Well, the second official. June 3rd. Yeah, June 3rd at Chain Reaction, which is, um, I've actually never played there, but it's a pretty iconic venue in, in the LA area for, for heavier music specifically. So that one should be really fun too. Excellent. And it's uh, it's Cartographer Band specifically, isn't it, on, on Instagram? Yeah, I think our IG is Cartographer Band. Um, actually, that's our uh, site too, cartographerband.com. And you've just uh, recently posted the uh, little merch that's going to be there as well at the gigs, which is quite cute. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for that. I've never I've never done merch for my band before. Last time I've had my band was in high school. You know, since then I've been like a hired gun. So it's been really exciting to hit all of these little benchmarks, and I'm like, whoa, that's our logo. It's on a shirt. A shirt. It says we need to suck our fuck, but it's great. Yeah. <laughs> You know what, really, man, I love it. I, I, I would purchase both of them and just wear them like simultaneously. It'd be beautiful. Excellent. Yeah, well, thank not? you for for being a guest on our podcast. It was great for you to be my uh, first individual solo guest. Um, yeah. Thank you so much back. for having me. No worries. Oh, you're welcome back. Literally anytime. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, 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 oh,